Diana Yahibi, welcome back to Criminal Justice 325 here at Sittingwell College, our undergraduate constitutional law course. I'm your instructor, Kara Damari Amachiapi. Today we are going to be looking at part two of Tribes and the U.S. Constitution. If you manage to stay awake for part one, I congratulate you. I don't know how. Today we will be not looking so much into the history as we did in part one, but for part two, we will be looking at some of the modern cases related to uh, taxation on Indian tribes and tribal members. And so some of this modern jurisprudence, again, we will be not going through as uh, heavily the Richard Pomp article, The Unfulfilled Promise of the Indian Commerce Clause and State Taxation. In part one, you might have noted we were summarizing comment and providing commentary on that article. In part two, however, we shall be looking to many of the cases which Pomp notes, and in fact, in the order that he notes, but we will be doing that from a lens more befitting of undergraduate students perhaps, which focuses a little bit more heavily on the facts of the cases and less about how they interact with taxation. As always, I would recommend that you check out uh, this POMP article, The Unfulfilled Promise of the Indian Commerce Clause and State Taxation, but that you do it uh, if you're not a federal Indian law practitioner with uh, either a enormous amount of time to learn the entire field or uh, just to get acquainted with the types of issues at play here. So to start off, let's look at Williams versus Lee. Now Williams versus Lee, out of all the cases you might have, we, we are going over today, Williams versus Lee is maybe the one you would have heard of. In Williams versus Lee, first of all, in around 1846, it is said that uh, the Navajo came in contact with the United States. At that point, a general, Stephen Kearney, had gone to Santa Fe, uh, or during the Mexican-American War, he had gone to Santa Fe, and the Navajo tribe had signed, the Navajo Nation these days, had signed its first treaty with the United States in 1849. They then signed another treaty in 1868, or some of the tribe. The immediate aftermath of the 1849 treaty was suspicion among the tribal members because uh, one of the colonels involved uh, ended up being in involved in the treaty making ended up being involved in the death of one of the Navajo leaders at the time. Uh, that Navajo leader, uh, Narbana or Hastin Narbana, and I might be pronouncing that wrong, I apologize. He was killed uh, during a fight with US soldiers in 1849. He was chief, he'd become a major tribal leader uh, after at Yemez Pueblo in 1822, 24 Navajo leaders had been massacred. Uh, and they actually had been traveling under a flag of peace at the time, under a, under a truce, in order to have a conference with the New Mexican government. He then fled, uh, he, he led the Navajo in a victory uh, in the nearby mountains, uh, he and several warriors went on and uh, began discussing peace terms between the Navajo and the new United States. And so that's who he is. And he was, his death came about after a fusillade. Uh, and he was actually, the story goes that he was scalped by a member of the militia of the state of New Mexico, of the new American government, uh, new, and, or the New Mexico uh, militia. So he was killed in 1849. And, and that was in part due to uh, these actions of 
one of the tree making parties, John Washington, Colonel John Washington. So relations weren't great with the United States. About 20 years later, uh, the United States under Kit Carson, and you might remember Kit Carson. Kit Carson is known for being a trapper and an Indian agent, an army officer, a frontiersman or mountain man or whatever. Uh, he had traveled across the West um, and eventually died in New Mexico, I believe. But the US began this campaign using him on the forefront to remove the Navajo from mountains of Arizona and um, to force them into Fort Sumner in Mexico. And that actually resulted in the long walk of the Navajo. The long walk of the Navajo is something which you might equate to say the Trail of Tears. It was in 1864 and it was, it was effectively a, a genocidal walk in, in essence. People, Navajo people were forced to walk from Arizona to New Mexico. Um, there were a series of these long walks of these marches where more and more people were required to do that. And it was dramatically uh, harmful to a lot of those individuals and a number of them lost their lives. Uh, at least 200 died. It was around a 20 day track. Um, some 8,000 people altogether maybe settled. Uh, and this was an area in which Mescalero Apache people had been placed beforehand. And it was a camp that was set up for maybe uh, in the couple of thousands up to 5,000, definitely not the upwards of 10,000 of individuals who ended up there. So just a really tragic and uh, uh, terrible situation, but that was part of this Kit Carson removal of Navajo Nation. Uh, in 1868, this treaty was signed at Fort Sumner in order for the tribe to be able to return to their traditional homeland uh, and for the US government to actually provide them with sheep and some cattle. And for this, the Navajo Nation was a victory, right? Especially after all that. Uh, so the Navajo Nation originally established in Western New Mexico, Eastern Arizona, uh, was promised to be around six and a half million acres. Instead, the tribe received less than three and a half million acres. And so in subsequent years, they began to acquire some of the land which they were actually due. And some of that was through presidential executive orders uh, and congressional adjustments. And so the tribe was reclaiming its land or especially the land that it had already been given, um, simply getting that land and was growing in the number of sheep and goats and livestock that were grazing the land. Uh, the BIA decided that the land was being overgrazed and uh, began an aggressive reduction program of the livestock that was pretty detrimental to uh, the Navajo people who remembered it in essence like what had happened previously to them. Um, there was an internment camp. Uh, so Navajo people are, are referred to themselves as Diné, right? And so at Bosque Redondo, at Bosque Redondo, there was an internment camp. This is in 1864. Uh, we talked about that uh, long walk, and this is where uh, they were headed during that long walk. Was to this internment camp, which I mentioned held maybe upwards of 10,000 people, including Apaches and other tribal members. And in this internment camp, they were forced to be Christians, to speak English etc. That land wasn't suited for farming. It resulted in many deaths and much misery and much suffering. Um, and then obviously that policy was reversed and there was some recompense to the Navajo for that extremely terrible 
situation. Uh, so hold on, we, we are getting into Williams versus Lee here. So we'll stick with this. So, so that's what's happening in Bosque Redondo. Um, and they're, they're, the government's taking, or that's what happened in Bosque Redondo. The government is now, the BIA is now taking uh, livestock from tribal members and the tribe and giving them, again, the sense of, of something similar as to what had happened before. Uh, Navajo in this period, in the early 1900s into the mid 1900s, had created an extensive system of self-government, including a court system. Uh, in 1949, the Navajo Hopi Rehabilitation Bill was passed and uh, that was passed by Congress, but Harry Truman, President Harry Truman vetoed the bill and removed, uh, had Congress removed, remove what they called the Fernandez Amendment, which would have allowed states to have jurisdiction over tribal lands. And so it was decided that that, that was not, and that was not a, that was this period in uh, federal Indian law history. Again, if you were not present for the part one video, please be aware that the language being used is the language within these documents. Uh, it's not necessarily the preferable language at all. But uh, there was this period of, of congressional termination, et cetera. It's a little early for that, but this was a, a similar idea. Harry Truman vetoed it in Congress substantially changed its ways and then previously had had substantially different ways. Uh, and so that Fernandez Amendment was gone. But come 1849, we're back on the Navajo res, uh, and there were traders, right? Okay, there's, this was, there were traders that when, when, or we're not back, we're originally on the Navajo res, um, traders who traded, T-R-A-D-E-R, -E uh, with the Navajo people, white or non-Navajo traders. Uh, after Bosque Redondo, more traders began to come. There was a military post at Fort Defiance in Arizona, which began to trade uh, Navajo wool for various things, including extra rations, because uh, I don't know if there's much to say for extra rations, but basic food for people. By the late 1800s, traders were buying, uh, by 1883 in particular, traders were buying something like 1.3 million pounds of wool, all right? A lot of these traders were actually Mormon. Uh, this was the, the individuals who were in the area at the time, and they began to change the system of, say, trading wool for rations to credit, all right? And in doing so, they effectively created, and a lot of Indian traders did this uh, to a lot of tribes and tribal members where they created the system of credit, which wasn't entirely understood or above board, uh, especially considering it was likely only the, the traders or the shop owners who were running the books for all of this. Uh, and uh, effectively, got everyone into debt. And this was something, again, that happened in multiple uh, reservation settings. So after 1890, the US government stepped in and stopped traders um, from collecting old debts and required them to use cash and not, uh, not this credit, which was sometimes called tin money. So part of that was, that or part of the, the system and part of just this whole trading system was that traders couldn't own their own store or their own land, all right? The land that they were on had to be leased from Navajo Nation or, or the Navajo tribe. Also, traders had to post a uh, $10,000 bond with the BIA and that was a substantial amount, right? Uh, so there were certain traders who had been present in the area for a long time and fostered relationships with tribal members. And they began buying um, and, and trading for uh, Navajo blankets, for example, to use uh, in the Eastern United States. By the mid 1940s, 
there were over 140 of these trading posts on the Navajo reservation. So a substantial amount of trading going on. Don't worry, we are still in Williams versus Lee here. As you can see on the screen, Williams versus Lee argued 1858 decided, I mean, 1958 decided 1959. We have a respondent who is a non-Indian who's operating one of these trading posts, operating one of these stores in Arizona on the Navajo reservation under one of these BIA licenses. He brings an action in Arizona state court against a Navajo tribal member and his wife who live on the reservation where his store is located to collect from them uh, goods that were sold or, or funds for goods that were sold on credit. They move to dismiss and they say that the tribal court actually has jurisdiction here. And so let me talk a little bit more about this. So we have Hugh Lee. Hugh Lee is the, is the Lee in Williams versus Lee. And remember that by the time we get to the Supreme Court, it's not necessarily the original plaintiff who ends up on uh, the left side of the V. Uh, it depends on who has appealed to the US Supreme Court, right? And so we see this case being known as Williams versus Lee in this instance. Uh, Hugh Lee was a, had, had these trading posts as mentioned and was licensed per the BIA regulations, which had been in existence for a long time. And he did sell goods to members on credit, all right? Uh, Paul Williams, on the other hand, and his wife, Lorena, Lorena, were members of Navajo Nation uh, and they also lived there as, as noted. They bought these goods on credit and didn't make payments. So Lee files a lawsuit against them and obtains a writ of attachment for some of the Williams's sheep. Now, a writ of attachment, I don't know that we've talked about writs of attachment before, but they're a type of injunctive release, relief almost. They're a court order to seize an asset or in this language sort of attach. And this is something that a judge will issue to a local law enforcement office, um, the sheriff, for example. And it's in order to satisfy whatever judgment the court had issued, all right? And so that's, that's what was going on when they tried to take these sheep from Williams. Williams moves to dismiss. He says that the state doesn't have jurisdiction on the reservation. Lee, meanwhile, is granted this order um, allowing the Apache County Sheriff um, to whom presumably he'd gotten or provided this writ of attachment uh, and had been able to take those sheep uh, to sell at auction the sheep that Williams owned. Finally, in 1954, the trial court denied the motion and in 1955 found for Lee, the Indian trader. Now, Williams then, the Williamses, appealed to the Supreme Court of Arizona. At the Supreme Court of Arizona, Williams said that this was a matter for Navajo tribal court, that this was under jurisdiction of the tribal court, and that in fact, there wasn't the authority uh, to sell the sheep that had been purported um, by this Apache County Sheriff. The court, the Arizona Supreme Court ruled that not only did the state, or the, first of all, it ruled that the state had jurisdiction to hear civil cases involving Indians and non-Indians because there wasn't an express uh, congressional prohibition. And we'll talk about that a little separately. It also ruled that federal regulations though prohibited the sale of livestock owned by Indians without approval of BIA. All right, so it did, it did rule in favor of not allowing the sheep to be sold, but ruled against this premise that tribal court had jurisdiction. So the case makes it up to the US Supreme Court and you have uh, the, the attorney for the Williamses arguing that Congress had uh, this 
plenary power, which we've talked about this plenary power doctrine, basically plenary, plenary power is this complete power, right? It's absolute, it's, uh, has no limitations or review, it has this total power. So Congress is said to have this plenary power over Indian affairs, right? Just like Congress is said to have plenary power uh, surrounding the spending clause, uh, et cetera. So, so basically uh, the Williamses who are the Navajo couple are arguing that Congress has this plenary power uh, to end tribal immunity and hadn't, and hadn't done so. And by the fact that Congress hadn't done so, we can think back to just like with the Dormant Commerce Clause that the constitutional framers hadn't said uh, that states did have these things, that an omission is still an affirmative action in that sense, um, that Congress had indeed upheld tribal immunity. On the other side, you had Lee's attorney saying that uh, the federal government created Navajo Nation and Navajo tribe, uh, unlike his example, the Cherokee. Uh, so he didn't think that there was any tribal sovereignty. And actually the Solicitor General at the time uh, urged reversal. Uh, so yeah, I won't, I won't get into that too much. But so you have the court uh, unanimously ruling, all right? And you have them looking to Worcester versus Georgia, which we talked about in part one, saying that that clearly established state law, state jurisdiction, et cetera, don't reach into the confines of the reservation, don't reach into the reservation boundaries. And without any sort of congressional authorization, the state was infringing on the right of the tribe itself. We remember we've heard this repeatedly too, that tribes have the right to govern with inside their, their reservation boundaries. Now, this Navajo Hopi Rehabilitation Act that Congress had passed at that time was designed to strengthen tribal governments and tribal courts. Uh, in his opinion, Justice Hugo Black, who was writing on behalf of the majority said, significantly, when Congress has wished the states to exercise this power, it has expressly granted them the ju jurisdiction, which Worcester versus Georgia had denied. Uh, he then goes on to discuss civil cases brought against tribal members by non-Indians and concludes that no federal statute gave Arizona the jurisdiction to hear those types of cases, all right? Uh, it goes on to say that any sort of exercise of state jurisdiction would in fact undermine tribal sovereignty. And let's remember, this is a unanimous decision. So this is a big decision. And you can see that here held. The motion uh, should have been granted since the exercise of state jurisdiction in this case would undermine the authority in tribal courts over reservation affairs and hence infringe on the right of Indians to govern themselves, the right which was recognized in this treaty with the Navajo and has never been taken away. Uh, only Congress has the authority to take these things away. So you can see Navajo, in, in this case, Williams versus Lee, uh, you see this clear history of precedent relating to uh, Navajo's nation's ability to govern within its boundaries and a prohibition on state interference with its ability to do so. And we get into the infringement test in this case in Williams versus Lee. And basically this infringement test is an independent barrier to state taxation. It looks to, so the infringement test looks to whether there's subject matter jurisdiction from the state and also personal jurisdiction uh, in as or did in Williams versus Lee and goes on to limit state power, this idea that states may not interfere with the right of reservation Indians, as it said in a later opinion by William Camby and, and Bracker, uh, they may not interfere with the right of reservation Indians to make their own laws and be governed by them. All right, so this is an additional independent limitation. Uh, does this interfere with 
the right of reservation Indians to make their own laws and be governed by them. And that's where we get this infringement test, all right? So uh, there were some issues with uh, this opinion, however, by allowing the case to be brought in Arizona court, that would undermine the authority of the tribal courts over the reservation affair or reservation affairs and thereby infringe on the rights of government of the, I'm so sorry, of the tribal nations of Navajo Nation, for example, to govern themselves. Um, but this formulation uh, had some defects, okay? So that's our infringement test and, and we've got some defects. And POMP cites three main defects. The first defect that Pomp mentions is that uh, basically there's a question about what happens when the tribes are a willing participant in the transaction. Uh, secondly, there's a issue within this Williams versus Lee opinion itself, uh, putting state's power to act on one side uh, and on the other side, putting this idea that Congress had acted consistently upon the assumption that states had no power uh, to, to regulate affairs of Indians on reservations. Now, of course, that is the consistent approach, but um, it's, it's basically saying on one side, you have the state not being able to act because they don't want to infringe on the rights of Indians to make their own laws. And on the other side, you have this argument that, that Congress has the ability to make laws. And you would think that maybe that would infringe upon Indians' ability to act too. Um, the third major defect or main defect, uh, not maybe major, but third potential defect is that there's some question as to where, to this, where this idea of infringement comes from. Uh, without a specific act of Congress, uh, you know, yes, there might be this ability found within the supremacy clause, uh, but that doesn't necessarily explain this other part of the right of reservation Indians to make their own laws and be ruled by them. Although we can look to a long history of similar rhetoric, right? But that those might be three of the pushbacks to Williams versus Lee. So let's move on to our next case here. Uh, and there's more that can be gone into about Williams versus Lee, but we won't uh, go into that anymore now. You're welcome to look more. Let's look at Warren Trading Post versus the Arizona Commission, the Tax Commission. I Yes, here we go, versus the Arizona Tax Commission. So in Warren Trading Post, we have uh, and we'll just look at this case directly. We have a the appellant, the person appealing, who was operating a trading post. We have a sense of these trading posts at this point on the Navajo Reservation. Again, had one of these BIA licenses. And they challenged uh, the right of the state of Arizona and the Arizona Tax Commission. Uh, I believe I noted in part one, a particularly litigious tax commission, although these were often, as we see, uh, the traders themselves who are bringing these suits potentially, but um, challenged the right of Arizona to levy on a tax on its income, the income of this trading post, uh, from trading with reservation Indians on the reservation. The state Supreme Court had upheld this tax. The Supreme Court rules that again, with Justice Hugo Black delivering the opinion, uh, Congress has broadly occupied the field of trading with Indians. So because Congress has broadly occupied it, this is a matter under uh, the scope of Congress and uh, this, this preemption idea, they have taken the field, the, you know, this uh, not a literal field clearly, uh, but this ability to regulate trading with Indians on reservations by all inclusive regulations and statutes. And because of this, states may not impose, and if you'd like to learn more about this, you can look up preemption, preemption doctrines. Um, states may not impose additional burdens on traders or Indians, and therefore the tax cannot be applied. All right, so that's the rule of the Supreme Court 
in this particular case, and you're welcome to read the case through at your leisure. But I should note a couple of things within this case, and we can kind of see these as we move through it. So Warren Trading Post in this case had actually argued that this tax violated the Indian Commerce Clause. All right, uh, they were looking for a declaratory judgment saying that this was an unconstitutional assessment uh, and other amicus curiae, including the United States government, argued on their behalf that the India's Commerce Clause itself preempted the Arizona state tax, that this wasn't simply Congress preempting this tax, but actually the Indian Commerce Clause itself did that. Uh, they said further that a warm trading posted that it was inconsistent with present taxation schemes onto sales to non-Indians, for example, uh, and sales made under Indian trader statutes, which there were uh, plenty of Indian trader statutes at that time too. They weren't necessarily looking to challenge the taxation of sales to non-Indians in this case, um, because in this area, there were very few non-Indians to whom they were selling anything. This was an insignificant group. There was not uh, the need to litigate that or divert the court's focus. Uh, but you do have, again, you have, you scroll down here, or actually see right at the beginning, you've got Justice Black, you go Black, and I believe we can go right to the conclusion here. Uh, you have him basically looking at the history of Indian trader statutes, uh, which originate as early as the late 1700s. So let me scroll up and we'll kind of look. This is only eight pages, so it's not, it's not impossible to look at all at once here. Uh, so there's a long history of these Indian trader statutes, all right. They provide, provided the COIA, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, basically with the authority and power, and this is all from POM, uh, to appoint traders for one, to Indian tribes, and for two, to specify the kind and quantity of goods that could be sold to the Indians. And let's remember, those region, reasons why Congress had stepped into this field and had preempted this field early on, right? And pursuant to those statutes, the Commission of Indian Affairs uh, included, you know, or, or pushed forward multiple regulations. And these regulations included prescribing in the most minute fashion who may qualify to be a trader and how he shall be licensed. Penalties for acting as a trader without a license. And again, we know about those licenses and we've seen those in the past two cases. Conditions under which government employees may trade with, license, with Indians and articles that cannot be sold to Indians and conduct forbidden on a licensed trader's premises. So this is all what uh, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs created these regulations on. This was fairly paternalistic. I think it has been accurately described that way, uh, but as, or not but, but and so is most of what we talk about when we look at especially early Indian law stuff, right? Uh, so let's just, let's breeze through this opinion together because this is again, one that might be a little bit more palatable. Um, we talked about what the appellant was claiming. Uh, the Supreme Court holds that it is a state tax that can't be imposed consistently with federal statutes applicable to the Navajo tribe uh, and tribal members, and therefore doesn't find it necessary to decide if the tax is barred by the Commerce Clause, and so doesn't necessarily deal with that part. They mention, again, this history. Navajo Nation was created by treaty. Uh, Navajo Nation, the area, the reservation, I should say, in 1868. Long before that, uh, the federal government had been permitting, permitting, note the word choice there, Indians to largely govern themselves free from state interference. And this had been the long history and the Supreme Court is citing this again, a majority, of, not a majority opinion, a unanimous opinion, all right? Not to, don't miss that, that fact. 
Uh, that's a pretty substantial fact. Uh, so goes on to federal statutes related to Indian traders. Uh, the first act passed in 1790 to regulate trade and intercourse with the Indian tribes. We talk about these trade and intercourse acts and requiring traders to obtain a license. Uh, this, this is a comprehensive scheme we've talked about of Indian trading that has continued to this day, this 1964 day. Uh, Hugo Black is saying on behalf of the court, uh, on behalf of the entire court, the existing statutes have made specific restrictions on trade with Indians uh, and one of them from 1876 uh, actually provided that the Commission of Indian Affairs had sole power and authority to appoint these traders, all right? And so this really changes, or not changes, but really uh, suppresses the state's argument or, or shows it to be ineffective. Under these comprehensive statutes, this is who has the ability to uh, regulate trade on the Navajo reservation. And there's no room for the state to therefore impose laws and additional burdens on traders. So this, the court fairly succinctly states that this is the state tax on gross income would put financial burdens on the appellant or on Indians with whom it deals, et cetera. So you do have this, this history. All right, so that's Williams versus Lee and then Warren Trading Post versus the Arizona Tax Commission. Now on to our third case under um, Williams versus Lee, we looked at for the infringement test, right? Uh, Warren versus Arizona, Warren Trading Post versus Arizona Tax Commission, we're looking at under this idea of preemption that Congress has already preempted it. And um, this is one of two Indian trader cases that Pomp looked at and that we'll look at too. The second of these Indian trader cases, T-R-A-D-E-R, -E is Central Machinery versus Arizona State Tax Commission, which we find here. So let's open that one up. Uh, a little bit of a longer case, we won't go through this one too much. Uh, I'll note that in this case, we are still in Arizona, of course, uh, and we're looking at a situation where an Arizona corporation sold farming machinery to a tribe and that sale took place on the reservation. And we're actually talking about Gila River here, I believe. Uh, so we're not, we're out of Navajo Nation. We're onto Gila River Indian tribe. But uh, the, the sale took place on the reservation even though the appellant, they didn't have, uh, the Arizona corporation didn't have a permanent place of business on that reservation and it was not licensed to trade with the Indians, okay? That transaction though was plainly subject, the court found two federal statutes and uh, regulations under the licensure of Indian traders, all right? So the court again found in this case that federal law preempted the asserted state tax. And the court found it wasn't relevant that they didn't maintain a permanent place of business uh, because the standards applied to these trader statutes to these traders as much as they might to a resident trader uh, and found that these congressional statutes and regulations aimed to protect these tribal members from becoming victims of fraud in dealings with sellers of goods that could easily be circumvented if seller could avoid the federal regulations simply by failing to adopt a permanent place of business. All right, so they didn't allow them out on either of those fronts. So notably, uh, this case is different than Warren Trading Post in, in two main parts of Pomp Notes. One is that uh, central machinery, as we noted, didn't have this permanent place of business. Two is that it wasn't licensed to engage in trade uh, under these Indian trader statutes. Nonetheless, the court uh, still found that the statute made it, well, they found that the statute made it a crime for anyone to introduce goods or to trade without a license in Indian country. Uh, so you have this licensing of even itinerant peddlers uh, under the language of the court. Uh, itinerant peddlers 
uh, per pomp were, were the rule more than the exception at the beginning. So these were individuals who'd move around and bring goods onto the reservation, change them for say furs or other goods and then get out of there. And that's uh, uh, pomp citing Prussia. But so the court isn't bothered about that. Uh, and Judge Mar Justice Marshall simply says that because the sale of the tractors happened on the reservation, the sale was solicited there, was executed there, delivery and payment were made there, that whether licensed or not, uh, and whether or not the sale was a one-time thing or not, uh, this was still, it's the, the holding in Warren Trading Post still applied in this situation, in this central machinery case. And so we find the court again, uh, going along with that. So that we won't, uh, we can get more into uh, one of the dissents or the dissent in that case, uh, one of the dissents, I guess. Um, but, and the dissents basically look at, sometimes the dissents are fairly useful. We had Justice Stewart who dissented and we had Justice, I believe Justice Powell who dissented. Uh, one of them saying that in this case, the BIA had actually approved the sale, I believe, and uh, may have been aware of approving state tax at the time. Um, and the again, let read read up on that if you want to get into that more. But central machinery created these two lines of thinking or brought to light these two lines of thinking. One is that there's no question of the potential for double taxation if a tribe should uh, choose to levy its own sales tax. And, and I didn't talk about that too much, but just, just trust us on that one for now. And two, that that might actually encourage off-reservation vendors to enter the reservation, right, and do business there. This was considered by Justice Stewart as a criticism, but actually it might have been uh, more favorable. Yes, it might have affected states negatively, but it might have uh, been extremely beneficial for the tribes. Um, you can imagine another vendor sort of making efforts to sell on reservations specifically um, for this purpose. Uh, and I don't know, you can imagine say dollar general or family dollar or something like that doing that. Um, and we did, we, I don't know if we talked about those cases in this class, but also cases. So let's, let's pause on uh, preemption and the Indian trader cases there. And let's actually get into uh, the distinction between on and off reservation activities as POMP denotes it. All right, so let's get back and cover this distinction between on and off reservation activities. We're gonna start out with McClanahan, uh, then we're gonna look at Mescalero Apache versus Jones. Then we're gonna move forward into preemption and balancing cases. We're gonna look at White Mountain Apache Tribe versus Bracker. We're gonna look at Rama Navajo School Board versus New Mexico. Uh, I'm not sure if we will get into some of the natural resource cases today, like Marianne versus Hickory Apache or Cotton Petroleum versus New Mexico or the gasoline cases, uh, or even go back and get into cigarette cases. But I think we're getting a little bit of a foothold into what some of these courts look like. So these first two cases, these two uh, on reservation, off reservation, cases are more well known than some of the cases that we just got into. Uh, this first one, McClanahan, let's go ahead and open that one up. In McClanahan, we have Rosalind McClanahan, okay? Rosalind, Rosalind McClanahan. And if I'm pronouncing McClanahan wrong, my sincere apologies, but she is a member of Navajo Nation, okay? So she's in Arizona. It's the 1960s, 1967. The money that she's made in her life has come from working on the Navajo reservation. She had, uh, and that she's made that year in 1967. That year she had $16.20 withheld from her wages in tax. She requests a refund 
of the entire amount and protest these state taxes. This is her state tax. When the state denies her request, she sues them in Arizona Superior Court. Okay, the court dismisses her case, says there's a failure to state a claim. She appeals to the Arizona Court of Appeals, which affirms, so basically agrees with the, the Superior Court, which is what they call their trial court. Uh, and then the Arizona Supreme Court declines to hear the case, all right? So all three of the Arizona state uh, courts have declined to hear her case, and here she is trying to get her $16.20 back, which in 1967 was substantial, don't get me wrong, uh, but this is just how difficult it is uh, when states don't follow federal Indian law, all right, and, and what the what federal Indian law is. Uh, this U.S. Supreme Court decides to grant certiorari to hear this case. We've talked about what granting cert means before. Basically, it's uh, an agreement to review a judicial decision, right? Uh, in the United States, that means under, under Article Three in the Constitution, this is a constitutional law class, so we should note that, that there is this ability uh, to appeal, and that's considered during the drafting actually of Article Three of the Constitution. And it's this ability for the Supreme Court to decide to hear a case. It's clearly a lot of cases are, uh, there's a petition for a writ of certiorari uh, for many cases every year. Many cases want to get to the US Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court decides what to hear. In this case, it decided to hear McClanahan. Okay, I decided to hear this case that had been dismissed at trial court level, had been dismissed at state court of appeals, had been dismissed at state Supreme Court level, and they decide to take this, all right? And they rule a unanimous, in a unanimous decision. So this was something that obviously the Supreme Court had strongly disagreed with Arizona's position on and wanted to make that known. Uh, you've got the basic facts. Uh, what more I'll say is that the holding by uh, Warren Berger, who I believe went to the same law school that I did, uh, maybe I'm incorrect about that, but I think is the case. Um, he he basically uh, grants or, or delivers his opinion on behalf of the court, the unanimous court that says Arizona has no jurisdiction to tax uh, Rosalind, uh, Miss McClanahan that they don't have any jurisdiction to impose taxes on incomes of Navajos residing on Navajo Nation, um, on the Navajo Reservation, I should say, whose income is wholly derived from reservation sources. So they put the state of Arizona in their place, all right? The state of Arizona had denied this uh, case at every turn, and here the Supreme Court is both granting certiorari from uh, a very few, very little case record because it had been consistently dismissed and then going on to rule unanimously against the state and say that there's no question that Arizona can't impose a tax on Navajo Indians residing on the reservation who are making their money there and by doing so basically making it clear that in any place where uh, people living on the reservation are making their income wholly on the reservation. States can't apply taxes or, or very basically. So there's some, there's some more backdrop in McClanahan. So First of all, I think actually, let me take it back. I have to issue a correction. It's not Berger who delivers the opinion of the court, as you can see here. It's Justice uh, Marshall who delivered the opinion of the court. Of course, that's Justice Thurgood Marshall. He's the first African American Supreme Court justice in the United States, actually, right? Um, appointed in 1967 until uh, 1991, a long time in office. 
uh, on the Supreme Court. But so he actually delivers the opinion. I take that back. Berger was the chief justice at the time, uh, but Marshall delivers the opinion. And he finds that there is nothing in federal law authorizing Arizona to collect a state tax. So again, almost a dormant clause uh, or, or a, a negative uh, to, in the sense of omission clause uh, and creating this not quite preemption, but this clear distinction between on and off reservation activities linked to the fact that there was nothing, uh, that it was clear that states couldn't interfere on reservation and there was nothing that made an exception for this type of taxation. All right, so you've got real basic overview of McClanahan there. Uh, you can look through this case if you want to. It's not, it's not particularly, uh, it's 18 pages, I guess, but so it might be worth looking through. It's a well-known case. There's some more information out there too. Let's move on to Mescalero Apache versus Jones. Mescalero Apache, and what we didn't talk about in McClanahan is McClanahan, uh, they basically found there was some, and you can read more from Pomp about this, some inapplicability of Williams versus Lee or the Indian Commerce Clause. You get some erosion of Worcester, uh, which was a, a strong foundation for much of this. You get more of an interpretation of this Arizona Enabling Act, which had proven uh, to be a, a statute which caused issues, right? And you get this more of this interpretation of the 1868 Navajo Treaty. But moving on to Mescalero Apache Tribe versus Jones. Mescalero Apache Tribe versus Jones looks into McClanahan a bit. Uh, but basically, the facts of Mescalero Apache Tribe versus Jones are that they had, Mescalero Apache Tribe had a ski resort. I think I might have discussed this in part one of this video a little bit, the Sierra Blanca Ski Enterprises Resort. And this was off the Mescalero Apache Reservation, all right? New Mexico wants to tax it. Uh, they want the business to pay taxes. Uh, and the, the, the tribe goes ahead and they pay $32,000, but they do it under protest and they seek a refund similar to what Rosalind McClanahan sought in this McClanahan case. And so they seek a refund. The state of New Mexico, just like the state of Arizona, right, uh, denies their claim. Um, but, and the New Mexico Court of Appeals affirms that. Uh, the New Mexico Supreme Court declined to hear the case, okay? and. Again, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds a little bit like McClanahan. This, this, the state basically making its decision and not reconsidering it, and the Supreme Court then stepping in and granting certiorari. The trial appeals from the New Mexico uh, State Supreme Court decision, and the U.S. Supreme Court steps in and grants cert to hear the case. Uh, in this, we have the same or a similar court. It's not exactly the same. I don't think. I'm not sure. Um, but we have Berger, is it the same? Uh, I apologize, let me, I'm now curious about this and I'm just thinking, so we had, uh, it is the same, it's the same, it's around the same time, right? It's immediately after. Um, anyway, they decide to hear this case. Uh, is it immediately after? No, they, just, they decide these on the same day. I'm so silly, I apologize. Uh, McClanahan and Mescalero Apache are decided uh, together, all right, on the same day, same court. Different opinion authors, though. In Mescalero Apache, we actually have Byron White, whereas in uh, McClanahan, we had Thurgood Marshall, right? So different authors of the opinion, but they're both heard on the same day, even though the facts of, uh, they both argued on the same day and heard on the same day, even though the facts of the cases are uh, you know, obviously different and from different points, but the Supreme Court decided to hear them together, which it does on occasion. And in the opinion of the court, uh, Justice Byron White notes that if the tribe had conducted off-reservation business, they were liable for the corporate income taxes of New Mexico. Uh, taxes on improvements to the land, however, were a different matter. Under the IRA, section 465 of 25 US code, which is Indians, right? Land acquired for tribes is to be held in trust by a tribe by the Department of Interior and is exempt from state property taxes, including uh, the 
taxes and or the the basically what had happened what had happened there uh, which is that New Mexico had sought the taxes New Mexico had sought for improvements to the land so the lower court decision the court of the original New Mexico State Commission of Revenue decision I suppose um, or the Court of Appeals, I assume it was the Commissioner of Revenue decision, was upheld, but it was reversed as to property taxes. All right, so what we see here is a little bit of a distinction or a clear distinction actually from McClanahan, which had found that if a Navajo member works on the reservation her whole life or for whatever time period and any money she makes during that time period isn't subject uh, to state income tax. However, if somebody is building a business, if a the tribe creates a business off reservation, uh, there can't be tax imposed for, for tribal on the tribal land. Uh, that's exempt against all property taxes, but uh, they might be able to tax off reservation business activities. All right. And let's see, we might, we might get a little bit more into this. I suppose one note I'll make about Mescalera Apache is that when we look in this case, we don't see, we see this opinion of justice or by authored by Justice White. Um, we don't actually see why immunity from taxation is limited uh, to tax on land uh, and tax on income. And we might wonder, what about other types of taxes? And that isn't uh, mentioned here. So certainly this might be a tax-free zone as POMP notes, for example, but there are issues that go along with that as well. Uh, we have McClanahan cited in this case, you can see it. It's right there, for example. Uh, yet it's not actually talking too much about the, you know, a specific page within that decision, which was uh, came out around the same time. Um, and we note that it's basically not applying McClanahan to off reservation activities. So these cases being heard at the same time, and. Uh, for on-reservation activities, applying it for off-reservation activities to a limited extent, not applying it. This case also looks a bit at, let's see if we can find it here. The Indian Bureau Organization Act, section 465. All right. so. We've got uh, Justice White noting that the IRA didn't strip Indian tribes and their reservation lands of their historic immunity from state and local control, um, but we have them suggesting that it's unrealistic to conclude that Congress conceived of off-reservation tribal enterprises as an arm of the government. Now that has changed and maybe was inaccurate at the time, uh, or, or probably was inaccurate at the time, but um, we'll note there, there are these other obstacles within this case. He just White basically says that the IRA doesn't forbid New Mexico sales tax as income tax, but he's effectively mischaracterizing that Justice White is effectively mischaracterizing uh, this New Mexico tax as income tax. In fact, uh, so there's some there's some issues with this case uh, and it's got a certain bit of lack of logic as you follow it along uh, if you decide to read it more it's about the same length as as our a lot of our other cases around 18 19 pages if you'd like to give it a look over and if you try to follow the logic you might find it fairly inconsistent especially if you're someone who looks into taxes and is interested in taxes uh, Perhaps this, the better case to look at from that day would be McClanahan, just in terms of uh, a case that follows a little bit more logically. Um, I'll note that the Indian Commerce Clause isn't mentioned 
in Mescalero Apache versus Jones, all right? Uh, and, that's, and that's kind of interesting. Also that there are dissents, of course, but it, it did feature, if you were to go back and look at the Mescalero Apache tribe's brief in this case, it featured prominently within that brief. And so that's kind of an interesting uh, difference there. Um, but uh, in this case, we have a ski resort that's basically next to the reservation. It's adjacent to the reservation. It's, it is a commercial enterprise. Uh, and so I, it's, it's a kind of an interesting case if you wanna look into it more. We won't go into it deeper for now here. Instead, let's skip ahead to our cases related to balancing or preemption. And we'll start off with White Mountain Apache versus Bracker, 1980 case. There's some, some good information out there about this case. Uh, we'll give it a little bit of a factual overview first and we'll look at what the case considered. Basically, you had you, the White Mountain Apache tribe. Do you know where the White Mountain Apache tribe is uh, located today? It's just south of Navajo Nation, uh, west of Mescalera, which we just looked at, um, uh, east of Havapai and Tonto Apache. And so Fort Apache, or White Mountain Apache tribe had Fort Apache Timber Company, all right? It's a tribal enterprise and they contracted with a logging company to transport and sell the timber that they harvested on Fort Apache, okay? The lumber was harvested from that land, which was held in trust by the BIA for the White Mountain Apache tribe. And they had this contract to harvest the trees uh, but the BIA actually controlled what trees would be taken. And there's a history to that, which we won't get into now, uh, but that's among what the BIA had uh, or did in other places as well. It also controls what equipment could be used, where and what roads, uh, and even logging truck speeds, all right? Those vehicles didn't leave the reservation and they only used roads built and maintained by the BIA, all right? And so you have all this happening within the boundaries of Fort Apache, uh, the White Mountain Apache Tribe Reservation. We're in Arizona though, so what do you expect but the Arizona, in this case, not the tax commission, but actually the highway department uh, to go after a tax from Pine Top, which was the name of the logging company that White Mountain Apache tribe contracted with. They go after this tax, a motor vehicle carrier tax and a fuel tax. Uh, Pine Top pays under protest, which we've talked about doing before, and then sues to recover or get a refund of those taxes. So similar situation in a way, we have the Superior Court of Maricopa County in Arizona. They grant summary judgment to the state, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, at the Arizona Court of Appeals, uh, Pine Top is arguing that McClanahan prohibits these taxes. And so they're using McClanahan, which we just talked about. The state, on the other hand, is arguing that Pine Top is not part of the tribe and is not owned by the Indians, and therefore there's tax. Uh, the appellate court ultimately affirmed the decision of the trial court. So very similar to the two cases that we just looked at, we have in Arizona, the trial court, uh, and then the appellate court of the state, and then um, we'll get into the Supreme Court of Arizona, which then denied or declined to hear or review the case. So very similar judicial position from the Arizona state courts, which have decidedly not, uh, paid attention to what the Supreme Court has said effectively and have continued to launch these cases into the US Supreme Court. All right, so we have Justice Thurgood Marshall again, as you can see further down. Uh, let's go to that for a second. Delivering the opinion of the court, all right? 
And what Marshall says is, once again, we're called, we're called to consider the extent of state authority. We're called to consider the extent of Arizona state authority, in fact, over the activities of non-Indians engaged in commerce on an Indian reservation. All right, sound familiar? Sounds like McClanahan, right? The state of Arizona seeks to apply its motor carrier license and dues fuel taxes to petitioner Pine Top Logging. All right, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, Pine Top and petitioner contend that the taxes are preempted by federal law or alternatively that they represent an unlawful infringement on tribal self-government. Remember, tribes are able to govern within their boundaries. The Arizona Court of Appeals rejects the petitioner's claim. We hold that the taxes are preempted and therefore we reverse, all right? So we've got another Supreme Court decision. Um, and this one, Marshall basically holds that when a state looks to assert authority over on-reservation activities conducted by non-Indians, the court has to look at the interests that are at stake. It has to look at, and this is where we get the balancing, the state, federal, and tribal interests. In this situation, you have a federal government, um, or you have the federal government through the BIA, which is regulating down to the speed of the logging trucks, which are driving on these roads, right? And um, they are controlling the, this timber industry. And that control is so per pervasive as to preclude any state taxation of the uh, Pine Top company or the non-Indian contractor. Again, they are a contractor. And so they effectively reverse the Arizona Court of Appeals. Uh, again, getting, you know, if, if a lot of this seems familiar, it certainly is. So let's pause on that for a second. If you'd like to, in this case, get more into the role of economic incidents or looking at this kind of particularized inquiry and balancing, or even Stevens's, Justice Stevens's dissent, Justice Marshall's view on preemption, Justice Marshall and the Indian Commerce Clause, go on over to that POMP paper and read more. But let's quickly move things along and at least look at uh, Navajo School Bird versus New Mexico a little bit. So in this case, we have uh, this Navajo Nation or the school that's located near the Navajo Nation re Reservation. And it's a public high school. And uh, the school closes, all right? There aren't any other public schools around. And so children either didn't go to high school or they, when school closed, school closed 1968 or they had to go to a far off federal Indian boarding school, all right? Uh, and there were taxes assessed against uh, the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department on the construction of the company that built the school. Let's actually look right here at the at the case and go through it a little bit, a little bit more understanding than that. So we'll go on down to Justice Marshall's decision. All right, so we've got around 2000 members of the Rama Navajo chapter living and I, I again apologize um, if I'm mispronouncing that. I, it's my duty to look that up ahead of time. Um, let me think here uh, if there was an easy way for me to just tell you how to pronounce that real quick. I'll do that one second. Let's just see if I can pull something up real quick. You can hear this. Technologists uh, making stone tools. This is a Ramachurk tool here. They're beautiful. They We've got a Rama pronunciation there. Uh, I don't know that that necessarily is the way the tribe pronounces it, uh, but we'll we'll stick with that for now. Uh, so we've got this these members of this chapter of the tribe who live on tribal trust and allotment lands in West Central New Mexico. 
these children who are attending this public high school near the reservation, the state of New Mexico decides to close the school in 1968. There's no other high schools around. Uh, these children are therefore either have to abandon their educational high school pursuits or have to go far away to a federal boarding school. In 1970, this chapter of Navajo Nation exercised its authority under the Navajo Tribal Code and established its own school, all right, to fix that situation. The school board was organized as a nonprofit corporation um, to be operated exclusively by members, these members of this chapter of the Navajo Nation. They are thusly a tribal organization within the meaning of um, the Federal Code on Indians, Section 450B, um, Subsection C. And they're using funds by, from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Navajo Indian tribes. And this is clearly a necessity if these students are gonna finish high school or be able to go to high school. They operate the school in an abandoned public facility and create uh, actually one of the first modern independent Indian schools. And so a cool history to that. In 1972, they look for congressional funds and this should be a flag. Congress has the ability to appropriate here. And then they, uh, and, and a flag in the sense of, if you're wondering whether or not this area was preempted, right? Um, uh, so Congress has decided to help provide some funds and then the board contracts the BIA for the design of the new school. They hire an architect. They get contract with the BIA for the construction of the school. They're getting funding and it's provided by a series of congressional appropriations specifically earmarked for this purpose, okay? The contract says that the board has to design and uh, the building contractor for the project, but that the board could subcontract the actual work, right? Because maybe they didn't have subcontractors that they could use to perform the actual work. And we're, we're reminded about pine top logging, right? When we hear that, they get bids from local contractors. Those contractors uh, include actually uh, tax as part of the cost of their construction, but they don't separately itemize that. And you get one contractor who's the low bidder, gets the contract, and they're required uh, to pay all taxes required by law. They begin construction, they pay the taxes, um, and are reimbursed by the board. Uh, a clause is inserted into the contract before the second contract, actually, uh, recognizing that the board could litigate the validity of that tax. So they then go on to protest this state imposition of the gross receipts tax. And after exhausting administrative remedies, which is how you go about uh, protesting something in administrative court, you gotta start off there sometimes. Uh, they file an action in the New Mexico Bureau of Revenue. And we have heard a little bit, I think we talked a little bit about how that case went up from there, or if we didn't, we can talk about it now. The trial court enters judgment for the State Bureau of Revenue, surprise, surprise and the Court of Appeals affirms. Sounds awfully familiar, right? Let's just see if the Supreme Court then uh, declines to hear it in the state. Uh, the New Mexico Supreme Court crossed the writ as improvidently granted. Um, and so they uh, do grant a discretionary review and then quash it, all right? There is probable jurisdiction, however. Um, the court here, the Supreme Court, uh, goes on to note, and who is this writing again? I think it's Justice Marshall, right? He goes on to note that, let me scroll ahead here. Where were we at? All right. They quash it. Uh, he goes on to note that this decision is inconsistent with Bracker, right? This White Mountain Apache tribe versus Bracker. And uh, therefore the Supreme Court reverses. And you can tell that the Supreme Court is a little bit annoyed. They say in recent years, this court has been confronted often or has often confronted the difficult problem of reconciling the plenary power of states over residents within their borders with the semi-autonomous status of Indians living on tribal reservations, which is McClanahan language. There's no definitive formula for 
resolving this question as to whether a state may authorize authority over tribal members, um, but they've identified relevant federal, tribal, and state interests to be considered. And this is part of this balancing type test, right? Um, looking for preemption, federal preemption, and then doing some sort of balancing of these interests and frequently finding federal preemption. Um, in White Mountain, they're, the Supreme Court is recognizing, just as Marshall writes, the federal and tribal interests that arise under the broad power of Congress. Again, you have a situation here where Congress has explicitly, through these appropriations, provided funds for the tribe to be able to do this, all right? The state's interest in exercising its regulatory authority must be examined and given the appropriate weight, all right? But the question is uh, whether federal law, which reflects the related federal and tribal interests, preempts the state law. Um, and we find that, the, or the court finds that in White Mountain, they applied these principles. They held that the federal law preempted application to the state motor carrier licenses license and use fuel taxes. Uh, they also found that the re federal regulatory scheme for harvesting the timber was extremely pervasive, right? So that it definitely precluded the imposition of additional burdens of the relevant state taxes. And again, the BIA was virtually involved in every aspect. This case, they say, is indistinguishable in all relevant aspects. Again, we know from the facts the the federal government and the BIA was uh, hand in hand throughout this whole thing, right? Congress specifically appropriated money for this purpose. The BIA was the one who controlled uh, so much of this. There are statutes, there are numerous statutes um, empowering the BIA to provide for Indian education, all right? And this policy has been further codified in Indian Financing Act of 1974 uh, and the Self-Determination Act, all right? So the court goes on and on to basically conclude that uh, New Mexico was not authorized um, to impose these types of taxes on this construction company. All right, so with that, we could get into uh, the natural resource case. So, and I'll, I'll mention that if you wanna learn more about, uh, again, views on economic incidents, uh, the Commerce Clause, uh, the Solicitor General's opinion in this, this idea of whether or not, um, who has more immunity here, uh, if there's an issue as to that, um, the role of state services, read, read up more, come to me, we can discuss it more, we can find out more information. If I don't know, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but also, we are going to move on and not get too deep into the natural resource cases today. So if you want to check out these, or we might bring this up in future classes, this would be um, Marion versus Hickorya, um, which is the tribe's own right of taxation or the tribe's right of taxation. We also got Cotton Petroleum Corps versus New Mexico, um, which is, there's some issues there. Uh, we've got the gasoline cases, um, Oklahoma Tax Commission versus Chickasaw Nation, uh, Wagnon versus the Prairie Band of Potawatomi Nation, Prairie Band of Potawatomi Nation. We've got uh, an income tax takes if you wanna look at uh, that a little bit more. Those can all be found within the unfulfilled promise of the Indian Commerce Clause and state taxation by Richard Pomp of the University of Connecticut School of Law. And I would suggest if you have more interest in these things, looking into that article, it's not an easy article to swallow, but you can get more of a sense of these things and you can look, look them up on your own and try to piece together, maybe use a webbed map or some sort of indexing that suits you, uh, what's going on here if you were trying to understand it for yourself. But that gives us a little bit of an indication towards the taxation piece of tribes and the US Constitution. So let's stop there for today and thank you very much for joining me.